<laughs> yep, it's your Crypt Keeper again, fiends. Welcoming you once more to the Crypt of Terror. For my spot in the old witch's slime sheet, I'm going to tell you a Yelp yarn adapted from a story by one of America's top fantasy writers, Ray Bradbury. Mr. Bradbury originally called this yarn The Coffin. I, being a clever tale teller myself, call it The Coffin. Richard Brayling had listened with increasing difficulty and much curiosity for a number of days to the banging and rattling about in his elder brother's workshop. Finally, he could stand it no longer. What are you doing, Charles? Go away and leave me alone. Can't you see I'm busy? <coughs> Charles Brayling was a dying man, a badly dying man. He seemed to be in a great hurry, between racking coughs and spittlings, to piece together one last invention. Please, Charles, tell me. If you must know, I'll be dead in another week. <laughs> and I'm building a coffin! A coffin, my dear Charlie, that doesn't look like a coffin. A coffin isn't that complex. Come on now, what are you up to? I tell you, it's a coffin. An odd coffin, yes, but nevertheless a coffin. But it would be easier to buy one. <laughs> Not one like this. You couldn't buy <laughs> one like this any place ever. Oh, it'll be a real fine coffin, all right. Charles fitted an odd thingamabob on the box before him. Richard moved forward. You're obviously lying. Why, that coffin is a good twelve feet long. Six feet longer than normal size. Yep. And the transparent top. Whoever heard of a coffin lid you can see through? What good is a transparent lid to a corpse? Oh, just you. Never mind at all. <laughs> The old men went humming and hammering about the shop. Richard had to shout above the din. This coffin is terribly thick. Why, it must be five feet thick. How utterly unnecessary. I only wish I might live to patent this amazing coffin. Yet God send all the poor people in the world. Think how it would eliminate the expenses of funerals. <laughs> but of course, you don't know how it would do that, do you? How silly of me. Well, I shan't tell you. If this coffin could be mass-produced, God, what money people would save. Oh, go to blazes. Richard stormed out of his elder brother's shop. Poor Richard. Yes, it had been an unpleasant life. Young Richard had always been such a bounder, he'd never had two coins to clink together at one time. All of his money had come from old brother Charlie, who had the indecency to remind him of it all the time. <sighs> Selfish old tightwad. Well, that's what I've been waiting for, Charles, for you to die. Go ahead, you old fool. Hammer your life away. Richard spent many hours with his hobby. He dearly loved piling up empty bottles with French wine labels in the garden. As Richard often said while sitting and sipping, sipping and sitting... Mm -hmm. I like the way they glint. <gasps> One morning, the old brother toddled upstairs and stole the insides out of the electric phonograph. Another morning, he raided the gardener's greenhouse. Still another time, Charles received a delivery from a medical company. Sign here, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Richard was never allowed to buy anything for himself. It was always bought for him, given to him. He had to ask for everything, even writing paper. Richard considered himself quite a martyr to have put up with taking things from that rickety old brother for so long. So now, while the hammering and the murmuring excursions went on, Richard just sat and waited. Finally, on the fourteenth morning, old Charlie announced, I'm finished! and dropped dead. Richard, without showing his inner excitement, arose, went to the window, watched the sunlight playfully glittering across the empty fat beetle-like champagne bottles, 
then picked up the phone and perfunctorily dialed a number. Hello, Green Lawn Mortuary. He looked to the stairs where dear old brother Charlie lay peacefully sprawled against the banister. This is the Brailing Residence. Will you send around a wicker, please? Yes, for brother Charlie. Yes, thank you. Later, as the mortuary people were taking Brother Charlie out in their wicker, they received their instructions. An ordinary casket. No funeral service. Put him in a pine coffin. He would have preferred it that way. Simple. (coughs) Goodbye. After they left, Richard rubbed his hands together. (laughs) Now we shall see about this coffin built by dear Charlie. I do not suppose he will realize he is not being buried in his special box. (laughs) Richard darted into the shop. The coffin sat before the wide-flung French windows, the lid shut, complete and neat, all put together like the fine innards of a Swiss watch. It was vast and rested upon a long table with rollers underneath for easy maneuvering. Poof! The coffin interior, as Richard peered through the transparent lid, was six feet long. There must be a good three feet of false body at the head and foot of the coffin, then, Three feet at each end, covered by secret panels, which, when I find the way of opening them, will reveal... (gasps) Of course, money. It would be just like old Charlie to suck his riches into his grave with himself, leaving me with not a cent to buy a bottle with, the old f***. Richard raised the transparent lid and felt about, but felt no hidden buttons. There was a small sign, studiously inked on white paper, thumbtacked to the side of the satin-lined box. What's this? The Brailing Economy Casket. Copyright April 1952. Simple to operate. Hm. Richard snorted thinly. Who did Charlie think he was fooling? There was more writing. He read on. Directions. Simply place body in coffin. What a fool thing to say. Put body in coffin. Naturally. How else would one go about it? <laughs> Richard peered intently, finishing out the directions. Simply place body in coffin and music will start. <laughs> no, no, it can't be. Don't tell me all this work has been for up. <laughs> we'll find out. There would be no harm in lying in the box, testing it. Richard noticed small ventilation holes in the sides. Even if the lid were closed down, there'd be air. Richard hoisted himself up. Simply place body in coffin and music will start. Really, how naive of old Charlie. He was like a man getting into a bathtub. He felt naked and watched over. He put one shiny shoe into the coffin, crooked his knees, and eased himself in. He crouched there as if undecided about the temperature of the bath water. <laughs> Chuckling softly, Richard lay down, pretending to himself that he was dead, that people were dropping tears on him, that candles were fuming and illuminating, and that the world had stopped in mid-stride because of his passing. He put on a long, pale expression and shut his eyes, holding back the laughter at himself behind pressed, quivering lips. The lid slammed down on him. From outside, if one had just come into the room, one would have imagined a wild man was kicking, pounding, blathering, and shrieking inside a closet. Then, silence. Richard relaxed. The lid was locked. There was nothing to do but wait for someone to come and let him out. The music began to play. It seemed to come from somewhere within the coffin. It was green music, organ music, very slow and melancholy, typical of gothic arches and long black tapers. It smelled of earth and whispers. It echoed between stone walls. It was so sad that one almost cried listening to it. It was music of potted plants and crimson and blue-stained glass windows. It was late sun at twilight and a cold wind blowing. It was a dawn with only fog and a faraway foghorn moaning. (laughs) Charlie, you old fool. Tears of laughter welled up in Richard's eyes. You old fool, you. So this is your odd coffin. Nothing more than a coffin which plays its own dirge. Oh! My sainted grandmother! Richard's eyes moved aimlessly about. His fingers tapped soft little rhythms on the satin cushions. Through the transparent lid he saw sunlight shooting through the open French windows, dust particles dancing on it. It was a lovely day. The organ music quieted. The sermon began. They're gathered together, those who loved and those who knew the deceased. 
to give him our homage and our due. Charlie, bless you, that's your voice. A mechanical funeral, by heavens. Organ, music, and lecture. And Charlie giving his own oration for himself. The soft voice continued. We who knew and loved him are grieved at the passing of Richard Brailing. Pfft, Richard? Why, I'm Richard. A slip of the tongue, <laughs> naturally. Merely a slip. Charlie had meant to say Charles Brailing. Certainly, yes, of course, certainly, yes, naturally, yes, Richard was a fine man. We shall see no finer in our time. <laughs> My name again? It was hardly a mistake using that name twice. Richard Brailing, Richard Brailing. Whirr, spoon, flowers. Six dozen bright blue, red, yellow, sun-brilliant flowers leapt up from behind the coffin on concealed springs. Help! In life, Richard Brailing was a connoisseur of great and good things. He savoured life as one savours of a rare wine, holding it upon the lips. A small panel inside the box flipped open. A bright metal arm snatched out. A needle stabbed Richard in the thorax, shooting him full of coloured liquid before he could seize it. Ah! A growing numbness. Suddenly, Richard could not move his fingers or his arms or turn his head. His legs were cold and limp. Another panel opened. Metal forceps issued forth on steel arms. His left wrist was pierced by a huge sucking needle. This time, he did not scream. His tongue was motionless in its anesthetized mouth. A pump started to work. While his blood drained out of one side of his body, his right wrist was punctured, held, a needle shoved into it, and the second pump began to force formaldehyde into him. A small motor popped and shrugged. The room drifted by on either side of him. Little wheels revolved. No pallbearers were necessary. The flowers swayed as the casket rolled through the French windows into the garden. Now is the time when we must consign this part of the man to the earth. Little shining spades leapt out of the sides of the casket. They began to dig. Richard saw the spades toss up dirt. The coffin settled, bumped, settled, dug, bumped and settled, dug, bumped and settled. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The coffin was deep. The music played. The last thing Richard Brailing saw was the spading arms of the Brailing economy casket, reaching up and pulling in the hole after it. Richard Brailing, <coughs> Richard Brailing, <coughs> Richard Brailing. The record was stuck. Nobody minded. Nobody was listening. <laughs> and that's the story, kiddies. Ray Bradbury story. Like this Bradbury? Let me know. There's more of his tales here in the crypt. <laughs> yep, old Charlie made that coffin for Richard, not for himself. I guess he knew his good-for-nothing kid brother very well. And now it's time to close the old witch's mag. We'll all see you next in my mess. Tales from the crypt. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> yep, kiddies, it's your hostess in the Horn de Fear, the old witch, staring her cauldron again, ready to serve you another horror helping. The reeking recipe I've cooked up this time was first dished out by a very dear friend of ours, America's foremost fantasy writer, Ray Bradbury. So tuck your drool cups under your chin, and I'll feed you my adaptation of Mr. Bradbury's. There was an old woman. The tall, dark young man stood quietly, not moving. Aunt Tildy shook her head, fussing with her knitting. No, ain't no use arguing. Got my mind vexed. You run along with your silly wicker basket. Land, land, where do you ever get notions like that? You just skid on out of here and don't bother me. The tall, dark man sat down. He just sat there, staring. The bone porcelain flowered clock on the mantel chimed three. Out in the hall, grouped round the wicker basket, four men waited, quietly, hardly moving, as if they were there. Now about that wicker basket, it's past six feet long, by the look of it, they ain't laundry. And those four men you walked in with, you don't need them to carry the basket, and why it's light as thistles, eh? 
The dark young man watched Aunt Tildy. Something in his face suggested that the basket wouldn't be so light after a while. There'd be something in it. Hmm, now where have I seen a basket like that before? Seems to me... Oh, now I remember. It was when Mrs. Dwyer passed away next door. Aunt Tildy set her knitting down sternly. So that's what you're here for. Thought you were working to sell me something. Well, you just sat till Emily gets home. She'll take care of you. She'll shoo you out of the parlor so quick it'll... The dark man looked at Aunt Tildy as if she were tired. No, I'm not. I'm not tired. Great sons of Goshen on the Gilbury Pike. I got a hundred comforters, two hundred sweaters, and six hundred potholders in these fingers. No matter how skinny they are. You run and come back when they're done, and maybe I'll talk to you. There was a noise. The mandel clock sounded three. Strange. It seemed to her that it had chimed three once before. Are you just going to sit there, young man? He was. Then you won't mind if I take a nap. <clears throat> just cat nap. Now, if you don't get off that chair, you sat there. You sat there and don't come creeping round me. Just going to hmm, close my eyes for a wee spell. So oh, feathery, so drowsy, so deep and water almost. Oh, so nice. Who's that moving around in the dark with my eyes closed? Who's that kissing my cheek? You, Emily? No, guess it was my thoughts. Only dreaming, drifting, drifting off. The clock chimed three again. Aunt Tildy stood up. The young man in the dark suit stood near the door. You leaving so soon, young man? Good thing. Emily is coming home, and she'd fix you. Had to give up, didn't you? Hmm. You couldn't convince me, could you? Well, young man, you needn't bother coming back here to try again. The dark young man bowed with slight dignity. He had no intention of coming back. Ever. Fine. Why, you couldn't get me out of this house. No, sorry. Why, I'm going to sit in this window for the next thousand years. They'll have to chew the boards around me to... to Quit looking like the cat that ate the bird. Get out and tote that fool wicker box with ya. The four men treaded heavily out the front door. Tildy studied the way they handled the wicker. It wasn't heavy, yet they struggled with its weight. She glanced around concernedly. Hey, now, did you steal some of my antiques, my books? No. The clocks? No. What you got in that wicker there? The dark man offered the lid of the wicker to Aunt Tildy. In pantomime, he wondered if she'd like to open it and gaze inside. Curious? Me? Shah, no. Get out. Get out of here. Goodbye. The door slammed. That was better. Darn fool men with their maggoty ideas. Ah, here comes Emily. About time. But Lange she looks so pale and funny today, walking so slow. Emily shuffled into the parlor, head down. <laughs> Emily, I've been waiting for you. There was the damnedest fool men here. <laughs> <laughs> Lady, hold on. Emily! Stop screaming! <laughs> a white smocked man, evidently a mortician, glanced up from the recently arrived wicker as Aunt Tildy stormed into the mortuary. Madam, this is no fit place for a gentlewoman. Well, glad to feel that way. Them's my sentiments exactly. Don't want me here. I want me home. Got Emily to feed. Sweaters to knit. Clocks to wind. The mortician looked at her, then at the wicker. He mouthed his words with apparent relish, and a winnowing of his knives, tubes, jars, and instruments. Madam, I have work to do. A body has arrived. You lay so much as a cuticle on that body, and I'll thrash you. The mortician opened the wicker lid casually. Then, in a recurrent series of scrutinies, he realized that the body inside was... It seemed... C could it be? Uh... This uh, lady here, she is a, um, relative? No, oh, you fool! Me! Do you hear me? Me! I want my body back! The mortician considered the idea. He shook his head. N no, no! Th things like this don't happen. George, show her out. Get help from the others. I can't work with a crank present. The four men assembled and converged. Aunt Tilly was a lace fortress. Arms crossed in defiance. Won't budge! She repeated this as she was evicted in consecutive moves, like a pawn in a chessboard from the laboratory. Finally, she sat down on a chair in the vestibule of the funeral parlor. There were pews going back into the gray silence, and a flowery smell. You can't sit there, ma'am. That's where the body rests for the services tomorrow. I'm sitting here till I get what I want. 
Mr. Carrington, mortuary president, heard the disturbance and came toddling down the aisle to investigate. Here, here, more respect. Oh, madam, can I help you? Go in that back room, then. Tell that eager investigator to quit fooling with my body. Mr. Carrington hurried off. After fifteen minutes of comparing notes with the mortician behind closed doors, he returned three shades whiter. Um, th th that is m most irregular, most irregular. Look here, Mr. Blood and Bones, you tell that, but he's already started pumping the blood from the body. What? Y yes, yes, so you just go away now, nothing to be done, the blood's running, and soon all the body will be filled with nice fresh formaldehyde, and besides, he's also performing a brief autopsy. Ooh, cotton me, is he? Y yes, to determine the c cause of death. You, you know, he marched straight in there and tell that cut him up to pump all that fine New England blood right back into that fine-skinned body. And if he's taken anything out, for him to attach it back in so it'll function proper, you hear? There's nothing I can do. Nothing. All right, all right. I'm sitting here the next 200 years, you hear? And any time anyone come near me, I'll spit ectoplasm straight squirt up the left nostril. <laughs> you, you wouldn't do that, you... You'll dislocate our business. You wouldn't. Oh, wouldn't I? All right, all right. You can have your body back. Ha <laughs> ha! Until he shouted in triumph then with caution. Intact? No formaldehyde? Intact? No formaldehyde. Blood back in it? Blood, my God, yes, blood. If you'll only take it and go. Fair enough then. Fix her up. It's Dale. I'll... I'll tell the mortician. Aunt Tildy didn't look at the body much. Her only comment was, Natural looking. Easy, easy, put the step wicker basket down to the floor where I can step in it. Then she let herself fall back into the wicker. A biting sensation of arctic coldness, a great unlikely nausea, and a giddy whirling, like two drops of matter pushing together, water trying to seep into concrete. The mortuary people watched Aunt Tildy's wriggles, trying to assist with boosting and grunting moves of their arms and hands, seeping into cold granite, seeping into a frozen statue, squeezing all the way. Come alive, Anya! Raise up a bit! The body half rose, rustling in the dry wicker. See... Feel. Light entered the webbed blind eyes. The body felt the room's warmth. Move. Walk. The body took a creakingly unsteady step. The body walked. Now, speak. Much obliged. Thank you. Now, <coughs> cry. <laughs> and Aunt Tildy began to cry tears of utter happiness. And now, at any afternoon at around four, if you want to visit Aunt Tildy, just walk around and knock on her door. There's a big black funeral wreath on it, but don't mind that. Aunt Tildy left it there. She has a sense of humor. Just rap on the door, and she'll say, Is it the man in black? No, it's only me, Aunt Tildy. She'll unlock the double-barred, triple-locked door, and she'll laugh and say, Come in, quickly! And she'll whip the door open and slam it shut behind you so no man in black can ever slip in with you. Then she'll escort you in and maybe pour you some tea. And maybe, if you're specially good, she'll give you a treat. She'll unfasten the white lace at her neck and chest and for a brief moment show what lies beneath the long blue autopsy scar. <laughs> Not bad sewing for a man. <laughs> yep, fiends. That's Aunt Tildy's story, the way Ray Bradbury told it to me. I hope you liked my little serving of shivers for this issue of CK's Mag. We'll all see you next in the Vault Keepers, the Vault of Horror. <laughs> Bye now. 
<laughs> yep, it's your dietitian of disgusting drama, the old witch, ready to stir up another stench snack in my cauldron here in the haunt of fear. So come on in, kiddies, and sit down by the fire. This time, my menu consists of another adaptation of a tale by my boy Bradbury, Revolting Ray, as I affectionately call him. <laughs> Listen to Ray Bradbury's superb The Handler. Mr. Benedict walked down the steps and out the gate without once looking at his little mortuary building. He saved that pleasure for later. It was very important that things took the right precedence. It wouldn't pay to think with joy of the bodies awaiting his talents in the mortuary building. No, it was better to follow his usual day-after-day -day routine. He would let the conflict begin. Mr. Benedict knew just where to get himself enraged. He spoke with Mr. Rogers, the druggist, and he saved and put away all the slurs and intonations and insults. There you are, you gold one. <laughs> gold one. <laughs> Mr. Rogers always had some terrible thing to say about a man in the funeral profession, and outside the drugstore, Mr. Benedict met up with Mr. Stuvesant, the contractor. Oh, hello, Benedict. How's business? I bet you're going at it tooth and nail. <laughs> Did he get it? I said, I said tooth and nail. <laughs> mm, yes, yes. And how's your business, Mr. Stuyvesant? And on it went, person after person. Say, how do your hands get so cold, Benedict, old man? That's a cold shake you got there. You just get done involving a frigid woman. <laughs> hey, that's not bad. You heard what I said? I'm <laughs> freaking <laughs> Good, good. <laughs> well, good day. Mr. Benedict was the lake into which all refuse was thrown. People began with pebbles, and when Mr. Benedict did not ripple, they heaved a stone, a brick, a boulder. There you are, meat chopper. How are all your corned beefs and pickled brains? <laughs> <laughs> that was Mr. Flinger, the delicatessen man. There were more, many more. Things worked to a crescendo. Finally, Mr. Benedict turned wildly and ran back through town. He was all ready now. <laughs> hey, somebody waiting on you, Mr. Benedict? <laughs> hey, get it? <laughs> I said somebody. <laughs> the awful part of the day was over. The good part was now to begin. He ran eagerly up the steps of his mortuary. The room waited like a fall of snow. There were white hummocks and pale delineations of things recumbent under sheets in the dimness. Mr. Benedict flung open the door. He was the puppet master, come home. He stood for a long minute in the very center of his theater. In his head applause, perhaps, thundered. Then he carefully removed his coat, got into a fresh white smock, and rubbed his hands together as he looked at his very good friends. <laughs> he walked along the sleeping rows of sheeted people. It had been a fine week. There were any number of family relics lying there. He noted each name on its white card. Mrs. Walters, Mr. Smith, Miss Brown, Miss Andrews. Oh, good afternoon, one and all. Mr. Benedict lifted a sheet as if looking for a child under a bed. How are you today, Mrs. Shellman? You're looking splendid, dear lady. Mr. Benedict pulled up a chair and regarded Mrs. Shellman through a magnifying glass. My dear Mrs. Shellman, do you realize, my lady, that you have a sebaceous condition of the pores, oil and grease pimples, a rich, rich diet was your trouble, too many frosties and spongy cakes and cream candies, you always prided yourself on your brain, Mrs. Shellman, but you kept that wonderful, priceless brain of yours afloat in parfaits and fizzes and limeade and sodas and were so very superior to me. That now, Mrs. Shellman, here is what shall happen. Mr. Benedict did a neat operation on her, cutting the scalp in a circle. He lifted it off, then lifted out the brain, then he prepared a cake confectioner's little sugar spellows and squirted her empty head full of whipped cream and crystal ribbons, stars and frollops. 
in pink, white, and green, and on top he printed a fine pink scroll. Then he put the skull back on and sewed it in place and hid the marks with wax and powder and walked on to the next table. Good afternoon, Mr. Wren, and how is the master of racial hatreds today, hmm? Pure white laundered, Mr. Wren, clean as snow, white as linen, the man who hated Jews and Negroes. Do you know what I'm going to do with you, Mr. Wren? First, let us draw your blood from you, my intolerant friend. The blood was drawn off. Now, the injection of, you might say, embalming fluid. Mr. Wren, snow white, linen pure, lay with the fluid going in him. Mr. Benedict laughed. Mr. Wren turned black, black as dirt, black as night. The embalming fluid was ink. Mr. Benedict moved on. Hello to you, Edmund Worth. Ooh, what a handsome body you had, powerful, with muscles pinned from huge bone to huge bone, and a chest like a boulder. Women grew speechless when you walked by. Men stared with envy. And now, here you are. Mr. Benedict severed Worth's head, put it in a coffin on a small pillow facing up, then he placed 190 pounds of bricks in the coffin and arranged them to look like a body. It was a fine illusion. Since it was a growing and popular habit in the town for people to be buried with the coffin lids closed over them during the service, this gave Mr. Benedict great opportunities to vent his repressions on his hapless guests. He had the most utterly wondrous fun with a group of old maiden ladies who were mashed in an auto on their way to an afternoon tea. They were famous gossips, always with heads together over some choice bit. As in life, all of them were crowded into one casket, heads together in eternal, cold, petrified gossip. The other two caskets were filled with pebbles and shells and ravels of gingham. It was a fine service. Everybody cried. <laughs> Those three inseparables. <laughs> At last, separated. <laughs> Not lacking for a sense of justice, Mr. Benedict buried one rich man stark naked. A poor man he buried wound in gold cloth, with five-dollar gold pieces for buttons, and twenty-dollar gold coins on each eyelid. A lawyer he did not bury at all, but burnt him in the incinerator. His coffin contained nothing but a polecat, trapped in the woods one Sunday. An old maid was the victim of a terrible device. Under the silken comforter, parts of an old man had been buried with her. There she lay being made cold love to by hidden hands and things. The shock showed on her face, somewhat. So Mr. Benedict moved from body to body in his mortuary. The final body of the day was the body of one Merriwell Blythe, an ancient man afflicted with spells and comas. Mr. Blythe had been brought in for dead several times, but each time he had been revived in time to prevent premature burial. Mr. Benedict pulled back the sheet. Mm. Mr. Benedict fell against the slab, suddenly shaken and sick. You're alive. You! Get me up from here! Oh, the things I've heard, the things I've listened to the last hour! Lying here, not being able to move, and hearing you talk the things you talk! The old man on the slab wailed, rolling his eyes about in his head in white orbits. Oh, you dark, dark thing! You awful thing! You fiend! You monster! Get me up from here! I'll tell the mayor and the council and everyone! Oh, you dark, dark thing! You defiler and sadist! You perverted scoundrel! You terrible man! No... To think this has gone on in our town all these years, and we never knew the things you did to people. Oh, you monstrous monster, the things you said, the things you do! I'm sorry. Mr. Benedict reached for a hypodermic. Mr. Benedict stabbed Mr. Blythe in the arm with the needle. The old man cried wildly to all the sheeted figures. You! Help me! You! Out there, under the stones! Help me! Listen! The old man fell back. He knew he was dying. 
Oh, listen, he's done this to me and you and you, all of you. He's done too much, too long. Don't take it. Don't. Don't let him do it any more to anyone. Mr. Benedict stood there. <laughs> they can't do anything to me, and neither can you. Out of your graves, help me. Tonight or tomorrow or soon, but come and fix him, this horrible man. The old man raved on and on, getting weaker. The room was suddenly very dark. It was night. It was getting light. The old man whispered. They've taken a lot from you, horrible man. Tonight they'll do something. And then the old man died. People say there was an explosion that night in the graveyard, or rather a series of explosions, a smell of strange things, a movement of violence, a raving, stones toppled and things swore oaths. And there was a chasing and a screaming and many shadows moving inside and outside the mortuary building in swift jerks and shamblings. Windows broke. Doors were torn from hinges. Leaves from trees. Iron gates clattered. No. Keep in away. the end, Keep away. there was Mr. No. Benedict running about, running about, vanishing, and a tortured scream no. that could only be Mr. Benedict himself. After that, nothing quiet. The townspeople entered the mortuary the next morning. They searched the mortuary building and then went out into the graveyard, and they found nothing but blood, a vast quantity of blood, sprinkled and thrown and spread everywhere you could possibly look, as if the heavens had bled profusely in the night. Where could he be? How should we know? Walking through the graveyard, they stood in deep tree shadows where stones, row on row, were old and time-erased and leaning. No birds sang. They stopped by one tombstone. Here now, look at this! Freshly scratched, as if by feebly, frantic, nasty fingers in the grayish, moss-flecked stone, was the name. Mr. Benedict. Good Lord! Look! Over here, this one, too. And this one. And this one. A villager pointed to the other gravestones. Upon each and every stone, scratched by fingernail scratchings, the same message appeared. Mr. Benedict. But that's impossible. The townspeople were stunned. He, he couldn't be buried under... All these gravestones! They stood there for one long moment. Instinctively, they all looked at one another nervously in the silence and the tree darkness. They all waited for an answer. With fumbling, senseless lips, one of them replied simply, Couldn't he? <laughs> so that's the dish, Trips. Hope you found it a tasty tale. This boy Bradbury has quite an imagination, wouldn't you say? Well, that about winds up the Crypt Keeper's mag. I'll just pour some blood on the fire under my cauldron, lap up the last trace of the Shizu's culinary concoction, and get ready for my next horror helping, which will be in the Vault Keeper's mag. The Vault of Horror! Bye now.